Lodge Resort and they have a, a locker room or an employee's area where you can change in, out of your street clothes into your uniform is so that you don't bring any pathogenic cross-contamination into the work area. Uh, what we don't want to see is that you're taking your clothes or your chef's coat out of the back seat of a car. It's not clean. It's not washed. It hasn't been properly pressed or ironed. And um, this is a common uh, practice. I've always have to send uh, cooks or chefs back to the locker room, tell them to get on a clean pressed chef's outfit. It's not just for sanitary methods, but it's also for professionalism. So the first thing you should do when you wa uh, walk into the kitchen is you wash your hands. You'll use the sanitary wash, the hand soap that's on the hand sink. You wash your hands thoroughly. Every time you touch uh, a, a food item or food source, you constantly wash your hands. And eventually this becomes a habit. You'll notice when you work with me in the kitchen, in the lab, you're gonna see that I'm constantly washing my hands on a regular basis. Don't take your hands and, and dry them on your apron or wipe them on your chef coat. I like to use paper towels, even though we're all seeing that they're very expensive right now, that there's gonna be a shortage of them. Disposable wipes or disposable towels are more sanitary. Because if you take what we call a side towel, which chefs will take, it's a basically a kitchen um, cloth or a kitchen wash type cloth, and they put it on their apron and they walk around and you'll see a lot of chefs, they call it a side towel. They're constantly wiping their hands on the side towel. And what happens is you ha get cross contamination. But when you're using a paper disposable towel, you're wiping it off, you're throwing it in the garbage and that, that alleviates cross contamination. But as all of us have seen in the news right now, uh, paper towels uh, shortage and uh, toilet paper shortages are starting to happen again. So uh, also when we work in the kitchen, we limit what we eat. Most large resorts will have um, employee cafeterias, employee areas where you eat outside of the kitchen. What we don't want to see is you standing at a table with a plate and you're eating. Um, we do allow beverages because when you work in the kitchen, they're very hot, but they should be containers that you refill. So your own refillable containers, they should be kept underneath the work table down on a shelf away from your work area. Um, they shouldn't be in a glass container. Uh, we try to alleviate uh, you shouldn't be smoking or anything. All, all properties have designated smoking areas. Many years ago, you'd always go back to the back loading dock and you'd, see all, you'd look for the line cooks and you always find them on the little back loading dock smoking cigarettes. Um, we don't want that. A lot of hotels now have uh, designated areas where uh, staff can smoke. And the reason why we do that is because you're taking the cigarette putting it towards your mouth, especially now when we have COVID uh, being transposed uh, around the world, you don't want to touch your mouth and then go in and start working with food or food sur surfaces. If you are a smoker, go to the designated area, smoke your cigarette, wash your hands, and then when you come into the kitchen work area, wash your hands again. Okay, any open wounds with Band-Aids, they should be properly bandaged. If you have an open wound, you double glove. Band-Aid, and then you put on two gloves on the hand that has the wound. If you have uh, coughing and sneezing, uh, and it's to the extent where you feel that you're very sick, uh, we ask you that you just stay home. Um, one of the biggest issues is uh, hair falling into food or hair follicles. So that's why we, we always wear a hat. A lot of your food service operations, they have uh, the chef's wear ball caps. Traditionally or classically, the chefs wore the large toque and the toque had pleats in it. And each pleat in the chef's toque represented one method of cooking an egg. And it was said that the chef's toque had 102 pleats and there's 102 methods of cooking egg. So if you think of not just like a fried egg or an omelet or an over easy, if you think of eggs and of uh, souffles, pastry creams, cakes all these are methods that use eggs so that's what it was said that's why they represented the number of pleats in a chef hat 
But as I said, the chef's hat is to protect your scalp from getting um, scalp flakes, hair follicles, or anything into the food. So now, now most establishments will have designer ball caps. In our class, we're going to use what's called a Comi. Comi is a short cap. A short cap means that you're at the first stage of a cook. It was also said that classically and traditionally, the taller the hat, the more seniority you had on the brigade system. There are some classical pictures that you will see of the old uh, kitchens where you'll see chefs with very, very tall hats. Well, today you don't see that as much as you would in a classic kitchen. Today in most of your hotels, the chefs will wear comey caps or small white uh, paper pleated hats that are disposable. Or if you want to wear a nylon cap that you can purchase from your vendor, uh, we also wear nylon caps that uh, can be wiped uh, clean. Um, don't try not to touch your nose. If you're going to sneeze, you leave the work area. If you do touch your nose, your face, wash your hands thoroughly. Uh, same with your face, your ear, uh, et cetera. Okay, um, hygiene policies, you should have signage all over your kitchen. And you can get many signage bilingual or in many languages. In the East, uh, East Coast, we have Hispanic and uh, English language. But on the Pacific Coast, when I was in Hawaii, uh, Washington and California, you had many dialects of Asian uh, languages, and you would also see these dialects in a kitchen, uh, wear washing areas, three compartment sink, and your vendors will supply those. So if you go to um, Echo Lab, which uh, has a corporate contract with Cisco, and even here, uh, Cheney Brothers has a corporate contract, they'll give you all of the signage that you need and they'll actually um, install it and hang it as long as you have a corporate contract uh, vending contract with them and purchase your chemicals from them. So training is very important. With everything going on today with COVID and what we discussed uh, about Norwalk virus and hepatitis A, what you want to do is before any new cook or prep cook or kitchen personnel, enter the kitchen, you want to put them through a training program. Now, in the state of <clears throat> Florida, it's required that all food service workers have a food handler's card. And the food handler's card is offered through the National Restaurant Association, but it's also offered through your local health department, your local colleges and university, but also through the National Restaurant Association website, you could take the food handler's exam online now. It's just like a driver's license or a driver's test. Now, you're in a program where you're taking this food, uh, the Serve Safe Manager's certification. So you don't need the food handlers because you're going to be a certified manager, meaning you're going to be able to manage at least 10 employees in a kitchen. Um, and that you would, uh, all your employees would have the food handler's card and you would have the manager certification. And then you would follow up on these food safety uh, training courses. You, training doesn't end when a person enters the kitchen. Training is continuous. So you would do more levels and stages of training throughout the career and throughout the years that a person will put in the employment while working with you. Okay, we've all seen many videos on the local news channel how many times, how many seconds you wash your hands. Um, there are people that have songs that they, they sing and rhymes that they sing that you can learn many different ones. Basically, uh, what we tell you now with COVID, it's 20 seconds. You see the slide that says number three, 10 to 15 seconds. With COVID, they're telling you to have your hands under uh, the sink for 20 seconds. So you would use the wash soap that is, is accompanied, the hand sink, you wash it. And then you'll notice throughout the facilities, you're going to have sanitary solution that you don't use with water, that they're sanitizers, that you can constantly sanitize your hand. And those are located throughout the kitchen, the dining room area. And um, we also have um, sanitary wipes that are local uh, throughout the kitchen. And then you rinse, and then there's a dry disposable paper towels in the containers 
above the hand sinks. You thoroughly wash your hands. So I should be seeing you throughout the day. People should be constantly washing their hands. Every time you work with a food product, every time you're going to complete working with that food product and you're going to go and work with something else, you constantly wash your hands. And it's a habit to me. You're going to see me constantly work washing my hands because of my years working in the industry, it's become a common practice. Okay, when you use the restroom, you wash your hands in the restroom. When you leave the restroom and you get into the kitchen, you wash your hands again. Many times you're going to see people, uh, some of you use doors that swing open and out in the restrooms. You always notice the metal plate is filthy. I always try not to touch that metal plate. I always try to like uh, try to push the door open or kick it open with my feet. It's filthy, especially if you're going, uh, many of you travel and you go on long trips and, you know, like on the Florida Turnpike, you have to get off and use the facilities and there's a line of people getting in both the men and women's restroom and you go to in there and you see the doors are filthy. So you try not to touch them. But if you do, when you go back into the work surface, the work area, you wash your hands again or you sanitize. And all of us now today should have some type of sanitary solution in our cars or in our purses or somewhere available, especially with everything that's going on today. Uh, handling raw meat, raw poultry. Um, what I tell professional kitchen staff is when handling raw foods, don't wash the cutting board and then bring it. I mean, don't wipe down your cutting board and bring it back to your, to your station. Like don't use a sanitary towel or something, wipe it in, and then try to work with a raw vegetable. Take the whole cutting board over to the three compartment sink, scrub it thoroughly. Remember, wash, rinse and sanitize then use it for the next item or product that you're going to be working with. Now, if there are many cutting boards, like in our kitchen or our working lab, there are many cutting boards. So what we say is take it over to the dish, three compartment sink, and then grab a new cutting board and then start your next step. Alleviate any stages of trying to uh, 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 cross-contaminate other food or other product. So anything that you do helps um, you from having an outbreak of food poisoning. Okay. Um, touching your face and body, we talked about sneezing and coughing, eating, dr drinking, smoking, we talked about. When we eat, we'll have a design, uh, designated area in the dining room. So we don't eat in the kitchen. The dining room is uh, split in two areas. Right now, um, we're not teaching the dining room course. So... We can eat in the dining room. So as we start cooking, we're going to taste some of our food. We will go in the dining room. We will taste it. At other times, I will say, take some to-go containers, and you'll go ahead and take the to-go containers and take your food home. When we share the dining room with the dining room class, right now we're one large class. We'll split in half. Half of you will stay in the kitchen. Half of you will go in the dining room. When that happens, you'll notice the divider wall in the dining room. There's a whole another section or area. And when we get into quantity foods, that's where we'll do our morning briefings, our lectures. That's where we'll work as a group or a class to write our menus, write our assignments. And then at lunchtime, the dining room uh, team will stay in their section of the dining room and eat. And then we as the kitchen crew will eat in the half wall where we meet every morning for our lectures and our assignments. So we don't eat in the dining room. We will allow you to have a beverage, but please keep the beverage under the table, coffee, water, uh, power drink or Gatorade. You have to rehydrate. We know the kitchens are very hot and you have to drink a lot of water. Also, if there are times when you uh, need a break or you just tell me it's too hot, I need to sit down, or um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling lightheaded from the heat, just tell me. You go into our designated area of the dining room, you sit down, you take a drink, you take a break. Um, and um, that is acceptable. In the industry, what we would do is we would take our 15 minute breaks, go down to the employee cafeteria, um, sit down, rehydrate. Every major resort has an employee cafeteria. When I was at the Kaloa Landing, I had a, uh, a chef, 
and a dining room server uh, that were assigned to the employee cafeteria. That's all they did. When you go into these large resorts, if you go out to Las Vegas, these very large casinos, they feed up to two to 3,000 people in the employee cafeterias and their regular meals. So when we did our meals at the Kaloa Landing Resort, when I was in Hawaii, you would go down, there'd be a full menu. The menu would be posted and the food was good. You would have salads, you would have hot foods. Um, and it wasn't just uh, mystery meat. We had Asian foods because Pacific West, you have a lot of Asian employees. We would call in and have sushi delivered some days. All this was budgeted in the food cost. So when we determined our budget for the kitchen food cost, we determined what the employees' meals, meals were. Um, some days we did really nice stir fry. Some days we had fish fry. On the holidays, if employees had to work Thanksgiving and Christmas because people travel, Thanksgiving was a very busy day on the, uh, um, in the resorts. So we would have food set up in the employees' cafeteria. So what would happen is that they would take their breaks, go down, um, we had a full beverage machine down there, coffee, uh, cappuccino machine, and Coke delivered the Cokes. We had Coke machines, and all of us was figured in the food, food cost. Uh, the staff, the team had their own carry-out to-go mugs. We allowed them to fill them up. We had an ice machine. They were allowed to fill up their uh, coolers, et cetera. Very important to rehydrate, and we're in a humidity that's the same type of climate. You have 80% humidity. You want to take care of your team, take care of your staff. And um, we priced all this out. It was included in the budget. So you'd go and take your breaks there. Um, you know, there were designated smoking areas. We realized people smoke, but it was away from the building, 200 feet away from the building, as uh, was a state law. And I believe it's pretty similar here in Florida. It cannot be near... Um, the customer service, it cannot be near loading docks or any food or prep area. Okay, um, the other issue is chemicals we talked about. I like to store the chemicals away from the dry stores. So in our dry storage area, we would have our canned goods, our rices, beans, uh, sauces, our uh, stocks, and then we would have our paper goods. And then in a separate storage area, a separate closet away from all this would be our chemicals. Uh, that's how it's set up here now uh, in our learning lab, our kitchen. And I'll um, show that to you. We'll get more um, as you get more acclimated and familiar with the kitchen. Okay, taking out garbage. Um, very important, even though we put garbage liners in, and before we leave the lab, we tie the garbage liners and we wheel the cans over to the, the door and then maintenance will come and take the cans. We do not have to take our garbage cans out to a dumpster, which is plus a positive. Um, many facilities, you want the dumpster to be away from the back loading area. One of the issues I had in one of the resorts I was consulting for in Kauai was the dumpster was literally right outside the back door of the kitchen, and we had problems with flies. When you're in a, in a humid, humid area and you're dumping out chicken bones and fish bones and things, you're going to have uh, bug issues. And think of what happens. Maggots, flies, stench. So that's an issue. Uh, so when you plan and you take over an operation, make sure the dumpsters are stored somewhere else. In large resorts, the maintenance and engineering department would come around in um, golf carts or small pickup trucks, and they would pick up the garbage, and then they would put it in the back of the trucks, and they would take them way off property, and that's where they would be dumped away from the kitchen area. This is, was in many resorts that I've consulted for, this is a huge issue, and they take that for granted, thinking, well, it's close to the kitchen area, it's easy for us to dump the garbage, but they don't think about the vermins, rats, palmetto bugs, um, cut roaches, and the flies that contaminate the working area. Okay. Um, and uh, antiseptics, we use these more now today than ever because of all the COVID virus. Uh, and there are many different types. Make sure that you're using, a lot of them now label will say, uh, you know, they, they work on COVID. 
Uh, they're liquid gels. And with these hand antiseptics, you don't use water. So when you're washing your hands, you would use the soap with the sink. You wash your hands for 20 seconds, then you use the antiseptic. Um, then, then you don't wash or rinse again. Okay, so um, nails, this is a big issue, big issue. When you come into uh, the kitchen lab, no fingernail polish unless it's clear. No long fingernails. So some of you that have your manicured hands and you have long fingernails, that's not allowed in the kitchen because those temporary nails that you get glued onto your fingers, the glue wears, they come off. Right. And what if someone gets it in their food? It's bad enough that they, they may see it in their food, but what if they actually consume it and then they find it in their mouth? And then this has happened. So starting right now, uh, next week, when we start cooking, uh, no uh, fingernails, no fingernail polish. Clear is only allowed. You're only allowed a wedding band. And common sense will tell you that if you have a diamond, a rock, or diamonds on a wedding band, please do not wear that. It could come off. You could lose it. It could drop in food. Now, we allow a wedding band, but when you go out in the industry, you're going to work with many chefs that will say, please don't wear any hand jewelry. And the reason why is not just for sanitary reasons. Uh, the other reason is for safety. We work with a lot of machinery and equipment. Think of a, a large mixer um, and you have a, a whip. And if your ring uh, or jewelry gets caught on that, it'll take your finger right off. Um, you'll see many in these large manufacturing companies where they have dough hooks, and dough bread. You'll see some people have been lost uh, arms and limbs in these machines due to the fact that they've worn bracelets or jewelry and it pulls their arm into that. So you may see that. Our lab, I'm allowing a wedding band. We're not working with a lot of heavy, big equipment. The 20 quart mixer is the largest piece of equipment that we wear. The common sense will tell you don't wear a rock or jewelry because you'll lose it. Uh, it could slip off your hand when you have, when you're constantly washing your hand, it could slip off, you could lose it in, in the garbage. And plus a diamond, if it gets dislodged, many of the diamonds are just mounted in a, like a little mount and it could get dislodged and you could lose it. Okay, we discussed the infection wounds on your manager's certification exam. It's gonna say whenever you have a Band-Aid on your finger or your hand, it's to be double gloved. Um, you put on just a really thin glove or a thin layer, and then you put one of the kitchen um, gloves that, are, uh, that I will have available in the kitchen. Now the rule of thumb when working with um, wearing gloves is uh, if you're serving food, when you're cooking hot food, let's say you're taking raw chicken and you're putting it into a pan, you don't have to wear gloves when you're cooking with hot food. Uh, the reason why is that food, when we cook it, remember, if it has uh, pathogenic bacteria, when it hits the pan and the food and it reaches a certain temperature, it's going to be killed. So the statement is, is that when you're cooking the food, raw food into a hot pan, you don't have to wear gloves when you're cooking. But if you're serving the food, you're taking the food and let's say we have food on a steam line, it's required that you wear gloves. If you're working in the pantry and you're working with cold food, you're mixing salads or you're taking small little components and putting them on a salad, it's re required that you wear gloves. They tried to, they passed a law in California where they said they wanted to be wearing gloves all the time in the kitchen. And it actually made things worse because kitchen prep cooks and cooks are putting gloves on and they were wearing the same glove all day long. They weren't taking off the gloves and disposing them. Well, what happened was when you aren't wearing gloves and you have your hands, you're constantly washing your hands. When you're wearing gloves or you're pulling gloves on top of them, um, they weren't changing the gloves. So they changed that law. And the law now is if you're cooking raw foods, you don't have to have gloves. If you're serving food from a uh, hotline or a steam line, or you're plating foods like in a banquet in a catering event or a large banquet kitchen or a large hotel, you are to wear gloves. 
if you're working in a garmage area, a cold pantry, and you're not cutting or chopping, you are to wear gloves. But many people like to wear gloves when they're cutting, chopping cold food in a pantry. Uh, that is your choice. You'll find that I don't wear gloves because I like to feel the food when I'm cutting and chopping. You'll see how fast I cut because of the years of experience, but that's because I'm feeling the food with my hands while I'm using the knife. Again, if you cut your hand or your finger, come to me or come to the instructor in the class at that time. We have first aid kits. If you are required to go to the emergency room, then we will uh, call our safety and security department. You'll notice in the learning lab, in the dining room or any of the lecture rooms, there's a red button. button. It's an emergency button. Um, only push this emergency button if um, there is a threat. The threat would be, um, many of you have seen the things that are happening in colleges and universities or if something um, breaks out in the classroom, this automatically notifies campus security. And they actually, you'll hear on campus sometimes when we're in lab, you'll hear someone over the intercom talking to us saying, and you'll hear uh, uh, like a buzzer go off and they'll say, um, this is the safety and security department. We're testing the in-room security system. So when you see those little red buttons on the wall, those are panic buttons. You hit them in a point of emergency. That, that, that's not for a cut or if you injure yourself with a cut. That, you come to the instructor or the faculty person, and then we will take appropriate measures and make the call to safety and security so they fill out an incident report. And if it's really bad, like someone falls, slips, get hurts, or pass out, we call 911 right away. And you do that on your cell phone. You tell them what building we're in. It's the SCA Kitchen Lab 113 Lake Worth Campus, and it's the only um, uh, kitchen on the Palm Beach State College. And then they come right to the facilities, then the instructor will notify campus security in correlation with the 911 call. So single-use gloves are used throughout production. If you have a cut, you double glove the hand that has the cut. Constantly replace your gloves. What I don't want to see is you put one gloves on during the beginning of service and using the same gloves. If you're working with gloves, it's just like washing your hands. Every time you would wash your hands, as discussed earlier, that's when you would replace your gloves if you're wearing gloves. And then, as you see, it tells you never to blow in the gloves, especially now with COVID, because you're going to contaminate them. Um, the gloves have cornstarch on them. I know some of, our, some of you are allergic to uh, the different powders. So we do, I try to purchase the gloves that don't have the powders on them. Um, so you'll see that the ones that we have in lab right now, they don't have any powders. So if you're allergic to those powders that go on gloves and things, these are non-allergenic gloves that we use right now. If you have certain allergies and you want to bring your own gloves in and they're in a, a sealed uh, Ziploc bag or they're in a sealed uh, plastic container, et cetera, that's okay. I'm not going to tell you you can't do that. Okay, we talked about bare hand. Um, remember when holding food in a steam line, 145 degrees, when reheating food, 145 degrees, when serving that food, we make sure we have gloves on during service. Okay, we wear a clean uh, hat. If you have long hair or uh, uh, your long hair should be underneath your comb cap. If it's so long and hanging from the sides, you will be required to wear uh, a hairnet. If you have a, a beard or a goatee, make sure it's cleaned and trimmed. If it's really long and exceeds a certain length, then you have to wear a beard covered. But if it's clean and close to the face, I don't require you to wear a beard cover. No eating, smoking, or drinking in the lab. There's designated areas. Don't keep your coffee to go cup or your water bottle on top of your prep or work area. Keep it underneath the table. Constantly replace and change your utensils. We have plenty of utensils in the kitchen lab. 
if you feel ill, just email me in the morning. And, um, you know, all the learning modules are in the course assignments. Okay. Jaundice, uh, I don't know if you guys know that jaundice is a sign of liver disease. So when people get hepatitis A, they get real yellow. And that's because their liver has a virus. Um, hepatitis, hepa is uh, the word, um, Latin word for uh, liver. So hepatitis is a liver disease. 